chance to chat with you very much. Thank you. Uh, we probably will come as no surprise that we, we asked to talk with you on the presumption that on Sunday night you'll be telling us that you're going to announce for re-election. Now, obviously this, this is off the record until Monday, so before we get into this, we're hoping you might uh, uh, tell us off the record uh, whether we're right about that. Well, I think, I don't think, so I will do it on the supposition that you're interviewing me uh, on the assumption that I am going to uh, run and I'll answer accordingly. Fair enough, all right. On that basis. You don't want to say the three little words, though. What? No. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. On. Well, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll imagine that that is, the, that you have made a go decision, though, and I guess we want to ask you when you finally did make up your mind. Well, uh, making up my mind as to, as to what the decision would be was left to the latest possible moment. I've, um, I've always believed, for one thing, that campaigns are too long, but I also, in the event that the answer was to be uh, yes, I, I'm very, I've always felt that uh, it's too easy to uh, find yourself making decisions on the basis of uh, the political ramifications rather than on what's right or wrong with the decision that has to be made. And I've, I've informed it when I was governor of California, I would not let uh, a cabinet discuss with me any political ramifications of any issue. I won't let m my cabinet now do that. We will only discuss things on the basis of are they or are they not good for the people. But uh, the nurse a decision, then it's a little bit like having seen uh, the other fellow's card in a, in a card game. You may be the most honest person in the world, but you can't take it out of your mind that you know where that card is. But, in, but you must have at some point made an emotional commitment to running again. Was that like a month ago or just two days ago or a week ago? Is there any Well, either way, it's, a, point? it's an emotional commitment as to whether you're going to walk away or whether you're going to keep on uh, trying. It, um, I can only say it has been, what I guess I'm trying to say is that I tried very definitely in my own mind to not even consider what that decision was going to be for as long as I could and until uh, I finally had to with all the ramifications that uh, go with it as to um, whether other people have enough advance notice of what they may want to do and so forth. And then I did it and it has been fairly recently. When did you begin confiding it with, uh, with your staff, Mr. President, or with the Vice President, or other people in whom you've confided the decision? Um, Some people say that happened over Christmas, or began happening over Christmas. They had had to come to me as to whether uh, they were going to do the physical job of putting together an organization, and that was done uh, without any declaration from me, uh, one way or the other. And uh, to this moment, uh, None of them have ever been told uh, what that decision is going to be. Even yet. What about your wife? Have you uh, yes, told there. her what you're going to do? Yes, because uh, whatever we do, it's it's we. Uh, we've it's always been that way uh, uh, with us. So obviously, I would never make any important decision without her being very very much a part of it. Did she have any reservations, Mr. President? Uh, no, I think normal wifely concerns uh, for my welfare. And uh, uh, other than that, what is it? The, there's a man, a writer so many years ago, Robert Burton, who wrote that there is no joy, there is no comfort, there is no pleasure like to that of a good wife. Was this decision ever a close call on your mind, Mr. President? Or did you always assume, more or less, that you would run unless something major intervened along the way? No, it, as I say, it was one, I've, I've firmly believed, I've always believed that uh, you get an indication from the people uh, as to whether you should or not, and you can't get that too early. Mm -hmm. so. Have you enjoyed the fact that you've been able to keep this air of mystery around this decision? 
<laughs> I never thought of it much from a standpoint of pleasure. It hasn't been a game or anything with me. Mm. It's just been a deeply held conviction that, oh, stems from a lot of things. I think campaigns are too long. Mm. I would welcome a limitation on them. Mm. I think we, one of the reasons for the increasingly low turnout in voters is not a lack of interest, I think, is that we've bored them to death. They're never free of something political going on. Uh, you couple that with the other things that I've told you already about how I feel about uh, not letting your mind uh, dwell on those subjects and uh, for fear it might affect your decisions on other things. And uh, so it wasn't a game, no, I just, I had enough on my desk without that. Now that you have decided, Mr. President, what were the principal factors in, in deciding this? Well, as, on the assumption sure, uh, that you're going, it would be, uh, number one, I think I have heard some encouragement from the people, but um, it would be the desire to finish what I think is well started uh, the economic recovery, to get this country back into a growth pattern, to stop having these recurrent recessions, which we've had eight times since World War II, where we just go from one and then in a temporary cure that distorts the economy and sets the stage for another one even worse two or three years beyond, to really have a solid recovery. And I think we have made a good start in that. In the international area, to really carry forward the effort to achieve real reduction of weapons, to set the stage for real negotiations with the Soviet Union leading to peace in the world, um, to complete something that I started early on in my administration with regard to our neighbors uh, south of the border that I don't think we've ever carried out properly, and that is uh, a friendship and a pattern of partnership in uh, all these countries of the Americas that are so unique uh, in this hemisphere. All of these things that remain uh, unfinished. Um, what, what is it that would have prevented you from running? Is there, did you have a set of guidelines in your mind that you went through? That would through prevent it? That would have prevented it. Well, um, suppose we, we weren't, suppose I came to the feeling that I could not accomplish these things that we were trying, this recovery that has taken place, uh, that uh, it was beyond my capacity to, to get done. Uh, suppose the people made it very evident that um, uh, they didn't like the course that we were on. Very high in the polls right now, so I guess you got the message that you wanted from the people. Did you seek anyone's counsel in making this decision, or was it uh, totally a private? Uh, I vote? thought it was something I had, to, I had to do, not counsel, but facts, uh, such as uh, polling and so forth. Uh, I think we're going to move on to another category here, Mr. President. Yeah, but okay. but before we do, it sounds like you really did not spend a lot of time struggling with this in your own mind, and it also sounds like you have more or less sensed the decision in your own mind for an awful long time. Are we wrong about, about that? Well, no other than the, what, what I said about uh, not, not having it in mind or not playing with that in my mind uh, until recently because I felt that what we were doing is what my mind had to center on, not what effect it might have on someone. Going into a campaign, what do you see as your biggest political hurdle? Biggest political hurdle? Mm. Um, well, frankly, I have to say, I think that some misperceptions that have been carefully crafted by uh, a certain amount of demagoguery on the part of opponents of what we've been trying to do here uh, issues that would have me uncaring for certain groups of our citizenry, and they're not true at all. 
And they've probably been the most frustrating thing that I personally have felt. Um, and yet the, they have, the polls indicate, they have been able to create this perception. Let me take one. Uh, not, I won't get into the fairness thing or anything else, which I think is very unfair, that what they're talking about. But uh, let's take the one of uh, the poll showing that people have a, an image of me that uh, I might uh, recklessly get us into a war, that uh, I go for, for violence. Uh, I came here believing that one of the greatest challenges was to bring us closer to peace. All through the campaign, uh, it is true, I did not support agreements like SALT II. And I didn't support them because they were simply placing limits on how many more weapons could be built, that you could continue to expand militarily, but, uh, but within certain limits. And what I said over and over again was, the time has come to sit down and talk about reducing the number of weapons in the world. So when you have troops in Lebanon and you have military involvement in Central America, how do you, and you did go into Grenada, and while that was a success, mm -hmm. how do you then dispel the impression that you are a warmonger, I guess is the phrase that's used? Well, because I've lived long enough to remember that there was a World War I, and after four years of trying to avoid it on the part of President Wilson, what he called his policy of watchful waiting, we found ourselves embroiled in that war and unprepared for it uh, because uh, someone on the other side, namely the Kaiser, over and over again expressed his belief that America wouldn't fight no matter what was done. And finally they did those things in, to where there was no choice but to fight. Now you come to World War II and the same thing was true again. I know that military men of ours after the war was over, when they could talk to their counterparts in Japan, and they uh, could talk about and rehash things, and their question was, why Pearl Harbor? Why would they have done that? And his officer said, why not Pearl Harbor? You were holding military games in Louisiana, and your soldiers were carrying wooden guns, and you were using cardboard tanks to simulate armored warfare. Um, Mr. President, you're not shy about mentioning your longevity and you kid about your age, but do you think that, that your age is a potential political problem in the campaign? No, I think somebody tried to make it one four years ago mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't work. And I, I've never heard it mentioned or I, I don't, most of the time now they don't even uh, uh, ask about it in the polls. And. Uh, uh, I've tried to start a rumor that I'm really not that old, that they mixed up the babies in the hospital. <laughs> Mr. President, your speech in Atlanta yesterday seemed to suggest, at least to us, that, that you think Walter Mondale might be uh, your potential opponent in the fall. Is that, is that a fair reading of some of the things you said well, yesterday? You, you can't deny the fact and your understanding that he's out ahead, but I would tell you, I was, mo I was most surprised when a number of you, uh, uh, well, not you or you writing magazines, but a number in the in the daily press, uh, the media, uh, interpreted me as aiming a line at him. I hadn't even thought about it. I was talking about them as a group. Oh, uh, Democrats in general. Yes. Mm. And I, what do you think about Walter Mondale? <coughs> um, <coughs> frankly, I think he has tried to be all things to all people. And I think he's made more promises than can, probably, can possibly be kept because as soon as he ke keeps one promise, he has made it impossible to keep another that he's made to someone else. Uh, I've asked our people to do a little uh, arithmetic here and find out um, with all of his expressed concern about the deficit, which didn't seem to bother him in all those years he was voting on spending bills in the Senate, um, to see just how much they add up and the figure's pretty high already that uh, his promises, if all kept, would uh, give us a budget that as one of his opponents in the Democratic contest uh, said of him would uh, make the deficit $400 billion. You did come out with a proposed deficit reduction package yesterday, I think, of about $60 billion. Have you had a chance to look at that? 
Uh, only slightly. Now, the only one thing that's been called to my attention is that um, we probably wouldn't have a military defense for our country if we cut what he wanted to cut. Okay. Regardless of whether he is or isn't the nominee, are you prepared to debate uh, a campaign opponent in the fall? I've always, in principle, uh, supported that. Uh, I think it's, it's too early to talk about or speculate as to terms of debate or any mechanics of that kind, but uh, I have always supported the, the idea. Okay. You've given the image of being somewhat of a reluctant candidate, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're a reluctant campaigner or are your juices starting to flow for another campaign? <laughs> uh, I don't know about those juices in a campaign. I don't know of anyone really that comes out of a campaign without um, <laughs> uh, being amazed that you could take it <laughs> that long. Uh, I must say that it has been kind of pleasant uh, to look at the news uh, with regard to those candidates that have been out there for better part of a year now and uh, be kind of glad that <laughs> you're not in it. Mm -hmm. well, do you dread it? What? Do you dread it oh. somewhat? Oh, or? no, no. No. Uh, no, there's one part about it that uh, you can't dread at all, and that is the opportunity to meet again the people of this country that I think are so wonderful. I love them. Okay. <laughs> We're going to switch back in, in another direction now. Somebody in this room, we won't tell you who, said that uh, it might be useful to try a couple of introspective questions on you. So we'll, we'll give that a shot. One of the first things you said when you came to Washington was that you used to complain about living over the store, being yeah. a bird in a gilded cage. Have you made your peace with that? Oh, sure, you have to. You'd be very unhappy about it. But I will say this, and I think every president before me has found it this way, that um, you really look forward uh, to those weekends at Camp David. It, uh, you know, the walk to here, the elevator up, and once you're there, you're there. And, um, and that's it until the weekend comes. And uh, so you, you have those things to look forward to. So it, you fit it all in. And it's, it, uh, I must say, the quarters are very comfortable. <laughs> I have no quarrel with that. Well, some people say that you seem to handle the burdens of the presidency so well that you ought to uh, teach a course in stress management. Um, what is your, your secret? I mean, you do seem very at ease in the office. Well, maybe it, I learned it early on uh, as governor of California when uh, for a time I found myself uh, becoming a victim of, of stress. And then I just sat down with myself, and it also had to do with this thing we talked about earlier uh, with regard to political considerations. And I said, the best that I can do is get all the viewpoints and all the advice that I can get from staff and cabinet, and then make a decision on what I honestly believe in my own mind is the right thing to do for the people. And I found that I started sleeping better. All the polls, Mr. President, uh, for a very long time have, have shown that your personal popularity has always exceeded your job rating. Uh, uh, what, is it, what is it about you that the American people <laughs> seem to like? <laughs> no, I, I don't know if anyone can answer that, 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 a question had. like that. <laughs> uh, no, I'll tell you. Maybe if there is anything, maybe they sense that I like people. I like them. Um, the public thinks of you as a very gregarious person, yet the people that work with you here say you're really quite private and reserved and that you don't reveal your feelings easily and that you don't have many close friends. Um, I what? thought they were all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, well. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that. Oh, I think there are certain um, things that you don't babble or blab about. Uh, but I think I'm gregarious. I, I like to be with people and with the group and, uh, mm -hmm. and to socialize. I guess the fact that you've played I've Got a Secret so long with this decision um, made people well, realize that you were able to be more of a private person than people thought. Well, yes, that, of course, 
had to be kept private because of my desire not to let political thinking uh, be an influence. Second term. Second term. Just briefly on the second term. Do you, uh, do you worry at all that going into a second term you might become a, an immediate lame duck or do you see some advantages to a second term that, that uh, you didn't have this time around? Oh yes, and based on experience. Because as I say, there's, there's one thing. Uh, I don't think there is any training uh, for this job that is better than uh, term, uh, serving as a governor. Granted, it is infinitely smaller in the whole thing, and it doesn't have a That's foreign relation. It's a too, though. Yeah, mm. but um, but it 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 is that type of job, and and I know in California that really the things that were completed and the great achievements were done in the second term, and it um, and I didn't find that there was any sense till right toward the very end. And uh, similar to the situation that I've been in for three years, although we have a majority in one house, there I had a majority of the other party in both houses. So it was an eight-year struggle, well, with the exception of one year when we got a bare lead due to a couple of special elections. But um, I found there it was the same struggle that you'd had in the first term. And I, uh, I don't think that... Uh, as I say, toward the end, yes, where it comes to uh, ratification of appointees who may be for term appointments that will be longer, or judicial appointments, then you find there are some people that want to take advantage of the fact that maybe they can hold out and stall uh, until you're gone. Yeah. What's going to be different about a second Reagan term? Uh, I'm trying to think in terms of, of that, those memories of the other time. Well, for example, in the uh, first term there, uh, we had laid the groundwork for the great comprehensive welfare reforms that were unlike anything that had been done any place in this country before. I never mentioned them in the campaign for re-election. Never made them an issue. Never held them up as a something to, to look forward to. Didn't want to politicize it. And immediately after the re-election, we went to work on them, and we achieved them. And they were uh, they had a terrific yeah. impact. Is there a comparable is, issue? Is there a parallel the here? Do you feel that perhaps in a second term you would be able to do something about the uh, the runaway cost of entitlements? I think that. Let me put it this way. I believe that there, there have to be some structural changes <coughs> in our government, things that presently you can't get at. I would think that, uh, that those would be, you'd have a better opportunity uh, in a second term. Uh, and this is part of the getting at the deficit problem over the long haul that I look forward to doing. Some analysts think a second Reagan term would be more conservative and far less pragmatic than the first, particularly since you've uh, pledged to fight hard on the uh, social issues like abortion and school prayer. Is that a fair assessment? No, let me, let me say what, what everyone's calling pragmatic, maybe I, don't, maybe I interpret pragmatic differently. I had this same run-in with some diehard people when I was governor and who thought because I had compromised on something and settled for less than I'd asked for, uh, they would have jumped off the cliff holding the flag. Well, you do that and you're never around to get anything more. My, if this is pragmatic, then I'm pragmatic. My belief is that in this democratic process which entails compromise, uh, you seek what you think should be done. And if you can only get half of it, three quarters of it, whatever, and politically it is impossible to get beyond that, I don't think it makes any sense to dig in your heels and say, then I won't play. No, you take what you can get and tuck it away in your mind that uh, you'll wait and come back 
<laughs> another time and try to get the, the next bite. And uh, that hadn't been my interpretation of pragmatic. That was, I know what the goal is, and suppose even at the very end, you've only gotten 70 or 75 percent of the goal. Well, that's a lot better than being back where you started. Do you think it's going to be a close election, Mr. President? I always, I'm a pessimist about that. I'm, uh, I've never been one of those, those fellows that says I'll take him in the third round. I, uh, no, I think you jinx yourself if you do that. I'm superstitious. Yeah, but everybody calls you the designated optimist around here. This is something that we don't usually hear from oh, your pessimism. I am on other things but that. But I think, uh, I, I always think that if you declare you're going to win, uh, maybe that comes from being a, having been a sports announcer and in athletics myself. You know, when I was a sports announcer broadcasting Major League Baseball, and I'd be pit calling a game in which a pitcher has not given a hit, and you're getting up there at the sixth or seventh, I never mentioned it. Because there's an old superstition in baseball that if anyone mentions that he's pitching a no-hitter, you'll jinx him and he won't pitch the no-hitter. So uh, I kind of feel the same way about campaigning. As I've said so many times, just take the advice of President Dewey. Don't get overconfident. You're in better shape politically than any president since Eisenhower in a second term. Do you consider yourself lucky, exceptionally lucky? Irish luck is something that a lot of people seem to tag you with. <laughs> That's something you've thought about? Well, luck is one name for it or not. I, let me just say, I think I'm, I've been blessed with good fortune in achieving some of the things that we have. When you stop to think, that just three short years ago, there were an awful lot of people in this country that overwhelmingly believed that the good days for our land were over, that we would never again see the type of thing we'd had. In fact, uh, we had people in Washington before we got here who said that we should give up any dreams of future growth for America. And uh, we have it, the growth. Mr. President, we appreciate the chance to chat very much. Thank you, sir. We'll, uh, we'll see you out there on the trail, I suppose. All right. Oh, well, I guess I got to leave this on, haven't I? Well, Somebody well, else. Well, 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 the first of many. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. Well, all right. Thanks again, Mr. President. All right. It might have been a lot easier to do if, if we were talking to each other Monday. Oh, <laughs> no, well, well we, can't, we can't do anything with it till Monday anyway. So, <laughs> all right. So the real we're problem saying. is figuring a way to get your whatever it is you say on Sunday night into the magazine. It's <laughs> Sunday at noon. That's a real problem. All right.